We're here at ASCO with the CEO of Maris, Bill Lundberg. Bill, thanks so much for joining us today. Great Appreciate it. So we've been talking about your data for a couple years now, it feels like. When the abstracts drop, stock is moving. This year was a particularly good update. So tell us a little bit more about that update and the opportunity for you in head and neck cancer. We're excited about the results that were shown with PETA Symptomab in head and neck cancer. And as a medical oncologist, I can tell you that this particular type of recurrent metastatic head and neck cancer is a difficult disease. For example, standard immunotherapy, which is commonly used, only gets responses in about two out of every 10 patients treated. And only about half the patients are alive at the one year mark. We've run a mid-stage study with 43 patients where we added our drug pedosemtimab to the standard immunotherapy regimen. We're seeing around, or more than six out of every 10 patients respond, which is more than three times what we would have expected with immunotherapy. And around eight out of every 10 patients alive at the one year mark. Now, this is substantially better than we would have expected. It's not only we who are excited about this. The FDA has granted breakthrough therapy designation to pedosemtimab, which is the tool that the FDA has to really identify the most promising medicines that, in their view, really can potentially provide meaningful benefit above currently available therapies. And talk us through the phase three plan, what you need to do in order to actually go to the FDA, or do you think you have enough now? We have two studies ongoing that are our registration studies, and we expect to provide the top line results for one or both of those studies next year. Those are large, randomized, global studies, and those test our drug with immunotherapy against immunotherapy alone. We've been making great progress in the site activation and the enrollment in those studies, so we're excited to, to get those results. At the same time, you do have some competition. There's a, another company here that's presenting that people have their eye on. So how do you view your drug versus the Bicara drug? We've really shown unprecedented results in head and neck cancer with pedosemtimab together with standard immunotherapy. This almost 80% survival at one year just hasn't ever been seen before in any head and neck program in this setting. And with, our drug has the highest response rate of any active drugs currently being studied or any established therapy. So we're really optimistic about the potential for our drug in head and neck cancer. And one of the discussions this weekend has been this idea, this role of HPV in terms of head and neck cancer and people who are HPV positive versus negative and how that might affect the results that we're seeing. So how do you view this ongoing debate? Are these really two distinct types of head and neck cancer or can they all be lumped into one still? In head and neck cancer, and this is head and neck squamous cell carcinoma to be precise, there are uh, several different ways that the cancers arise. One is through carcinogen exposure smoking. The other is through infection with human papillomavirus, which is a sexually transmitted infection. And that can cause the cancers that arise in the head and neck area as well as in other areas. Typically, these diseases have historically been treated the same. And even for the past five registration studies in this field, they've all been grouped together because their characteristics and their behavior and their outcomes have been very similar. So if you look at the way the FDA has approached how do you consider and approve a medicine, it's really been the overall and broad population. And I'm really gratified to say that our drug pedosemtimab has shown really compelling results in the overall population, both those uh, tumors that are not HPV driven and those that are HPV driven. So we're encouraged that we have a medicine for the broader population. Mm -hmm. And you're also expecting some data later this year in, um, colorectal cancer, and from what it sounds like, the expectations are a little bit low there. So why do you think you'll be able to pull this off? So we've seen just compelling results in head and neck cancer, and our drug seems so much better than the historical data for a similar or earlier version of an EGFR antibody called cetuximab. And given that our drug seems to have so much more activity than this other drug, this other drug is used in colorectal cancer. It's a common first-line treatment mechanism. So we think that our drug, because it's showing better results than we'd expect for cetuximab in head and neck cancer, really does have a lot of promise in colorectal cancer. So where else do you think you'll be able to go besides head and neck, colorectal cancer, what's next? One of the data sets that was shared, one of the, the readouts that was shared this year at ASCO was in the local treatment of an earlier stages of head and neck cancer where the immunotherapy regimen has, is already showing to be quite effective. And we know that when we combine our drug with that immunotherapy regimen, it can provide a dramatic increase in activity or efficacy. So we're hopeful that our drug may be able to provide dramatic increases in benefit in the locally advanced setting as well. Mm -hmm. And you're aiming you know, for accelerated approval based on some of the earlier outcomes. 
I wonder, does that change at all, given the new administration? You have a new FDA commissioner, uh, new head of CBER. I don't know if that would directly affect your drug, but just it seems like there's a new paradigm. So does that change your plans at all? So I think there are a lot of headlines around regulatory and the FDA. And it's important to keep in mind over time, there are always regulatory policy debates, but underlying that has been a very consistent uh, act, set of activities from the FDA in evaluating medicines for the American people and making sure that they have both the efficacy and the safety that's appropriate for their labeled intended use. And what we've seen is a consistent uh, uh, set of interactions with the FDA, they're very supportive of medicines that really have the promising opportunity to really be a benefit. So we are continuing to be optimistic that the accelerated approval pathway, which is the, the mainstay of cancer approvals over the past 20 years, continues to be a very important and central component of the FDA. And have you noticed any changes so far in your discussions with the FDA, the interactions with them, any changes in terms of the people who are on the teams that you're interacting with? We get asked that question a lot. I know, everyone imagine. says that. <laughs> and we, ha we have seen a really consistent set of interactions with the FDA. We received breakthrough therapy this year, and that process and the interaction and the tenor was virtually identical to having received breakthrough therapy last year for pedosemtimab. And so from our view, working with the teams who are really committed to being able to bring forward the best medicines, we continue to see real dedication from the FDA. And it feels like just you know, taking a step back, it feels like bispecifics are having a moment right now where everyone is talking about them and try, wants to sort of get in this game. Do you feel like we're at the peak of the hype there? Or where are we and you know, how much more room do we have? We have a long view of this because Miris has been around for more than a decade with a really foundational approach to making bispecifics. And from our own discovery efforts in platform, we had our first drug approval last year by Sengri, which received accelerated approval. It's a highly novel medicine in a subset of lung and pancreatic cancers. And now with pedosemtimab showing great promise, we view the trajectory as really promising and moving forward. We think that a number of other approvals that have happened recently only support the strength and the opportunity for bispecifics. Mm -hmm. And because everyone wants to get in this space, obviously there's a question about M&A. Everyone wants to know when will you be acquired? So what's it like out there? What are your conversations with large pharma companies, potential partners, acquiries? Look, I'm a medical oncologist, and my commitment is to really bring patient, bring new innovative medicines to patients. And that's really what we try to do at Miris. We're focused head down on delivering pedosemtimab and head and neck cancer, and we think there's really potentially broad opportunity for our medicine. Mm -hmm. And when you do talk to people, though, out there right now, what is it like in terms of the prices? We've heard about the potential, you know, of prices coming down, great time to be a buyer. Is that what you've heard? I mean, again, you know, from our view, we're a company dedicated to making medicines. I'm sure you have other experts who can speak much more cogently about the business side of the industry. But our commitment is to really making innovative medicines and closing in on cancer. Great. Well, that's all we have time for. Thanks so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Thank you.